giving me this opportunity to speak at this wonderful conference. It's been fantastic. So I'm going to speak about equivariant complex Bordism today. So we begin with definition of a tangentially stably complex TK manifold. So this is a smooth compact manifold with a smooth TK action uh, that has a complex equivariant structure on the stabilized tangent bundle. So this is the direct sum of the tangent bundle with some uh, additional copies of uh, the trivial bundle that we also assume has a trivial action. So some n greater than or equal to zero. Uh, there's a, an equivalence relation on uh, such structures that if we stabilize with further copies of C, that their induced complex structures are equivalent. When n equals zero, we have what's called an almost complex structure. So you might think it's slightly strange that we want the trivial action, um, because why not stabilize with representations if we're doing equivariant uh, topology? And the reason is due to the next proposition, is that if we have such a manifold, then its fixed point set is also uh, a tangentially stably complex TK manifold with obviously trivial action. And imp more importantly, its normal bundle is a complex TK bundle on the nose. So I mean, there's a short proof. I'm not going to talk you through it. But if we were to stabilize with respect to representations, this would not be true. We'd only be able to say that the normal bundle of the fixed point set into the manifold would be a stably uh, complex bundle. OK. So. Suppose we have an isolated fixed point in our manifold, and we have a complex equivalent structure on the restricted stable bundle. And this implies, obviously, that M is even dimensional by the previous theorem as the, as the normal bundle is a complex bundle. So we can write the tangent space as a direct sum of irreducible representations um, where we, yeah. Where we think of our irreducible representation, we can think of them as integral vectors. They're weight, they're weight vectors. So notice that the tangent space has two natural orientations. One comes from its complex structure, and the other from the natural orientation on the manifold that comes from this, the stably complex structure. And has been done many times before. We define the sign of the fixed point P to be plus one if these two orientations coincide, and minus one if these two orientations are different. So if you have an almost complex structure, then we always have the signs to be plus one. So now we're going to let's slightly restrict the manifolds that we're looking at. So we can use GKM theory to tell us something about their, well, their borderism. So we're going to assume that the action is effective. Uh, the manifold has only isolated fixed points. Uh, and then this third condition, the GKM condition, that these uh, integral vectors, which come from the tangential representation, are pairwise linearly independent. So this is called you know, the GKM condition. And the reason we want this particular condition is so that we can say that the one skeleton of our manifold uh, consists of uh, only uh, equivariant embedded two spheres with exactly two fixed points, as you would have heard in Shintaro's talk yesterday if you, were, if you were there. So if we quotient out the one skeleton by the torus, then we get the structure of a graph. So we define what's called a slightly, slightly generalized GKM graph. So again, Shintaro went through mo most of this definition yesterday. So we can assume we've got an n-valent connected graph with we denote the vertices by V, the edges by E, and this diagram, we want a set of oriented edges. So each edge appears twice in E or gamma with uh, both orientations. And we let I of E be the initial vertex of E and T of E be the terminal vertex of E. And we also denote for a vertex P, E gamma sub P to be the set of edges emanating out from P. 
And then the conditions are that we have this axial function, which is a map from E to these set of irreducible representations that satisfy the following conditions. So the first one is that alpha of E bar, E bar being E with the opposite orientation, is always is equal to plus or minus alpha E. Uh, and this is the condition why we're calling these generalized GKM graphs, because usually in a GKM graph we ask that alpha of E bar equals minus alpha of E, as Shintaro spoke yesterday. And that's because originally uh, the theory is used to study almost complex structures. Because we're using, because we want to study stably complex structures, it's a wider class of objects that we need a slightly weaker condition. The second condition is that the elements are pairwise linearly linear independent, as we spoke about before. And the third condition is a slightly complicated condition, which Shintaro talked about extensively in his talk yesterday. I'm going to say skip over it. Now we also require that we have an orientation which was originally defined in uh, Maida, Masuda and Panov's paper where we assign to each vertex either a plus or minus one uh, that satisfies the condition that on an edge the two, the two signs are the same if and only if we have this uh, normal GKM condition where alpha of E is the negative of alpha of E bar. And if it's not, then uh, their two signs must be different. So not all uh, generalized GKM graphs can be orientab are orientable. Uh, we're only going to be the ones interested in the ones that are orientable. If I had a, an almost complex structure, then they're all orientable. You just stick plus, plus one on each vertex. OK, so. The, the obvious example that we need is that from a tangent, tangentially stably complex torus manifold with uh, isolated fixed points and the GKM condition, we can define one of these graphs. We just stick the vertices to be the f isolated fixed points and the edges to be these embedded two spheres where that are fixed by a co-dimension one torus action. Uh, so each one of these spheres contains exactly two fixed points, and we can write the tangential representation as a sum of these irreducible representations, and they correspond to the edges emanating out from P. So this gives us an axial function by assigning to each edge its corresponding weight vector of the representation. So you can check that these satisfy the conditions for being one of these axial functions to get one of these GKM graphs. And we also get the orientation. This comes from, well, you can use precisely the, the formula we used for the, the definition for orientation of a, a fixed point in terms of whether the, those two orientations coincide or not. And as an example, we use the example that Shintaro also used extensively yesterday, that we have uh, a non-integral non almost complex structure on S6 when we think of it as G2 mod SU3, the homogeneous space, and we have a smooth action of the maximal torus T2 on this. And if, you, this, if we quotient out by this, we get uh, the graph with two vertices and three edges that you can check, well, Shintaro checked yesterday that this satisfies this GKM condition. We can label it like such. And then each, both of these vertices have sign plus in this case because it's a an almost complex structure. It's quite interesting, you can use the common torics to see that this is the, actually the, own, the only torus equivariant almost complex structure you can get on S6. You can't get one with a T3 action, for example, or, a, or an S1 action. It follows exactly from the uh, common torics and the definition of the GKM graph. Okay. So now we're going to, we're now 
GKM graphs, uh, as we know, have been used to calculate the Betty numbers and the equivariant cohomology and the equivariant K theory of M. And the whole point of this talk is they also contain all the information you need to uh, distinguish their bordism classes. So we're going to define a polynomial associated to each one of these oriented generalized GKM graphs, which lies in the polynomial algebra generated by all the non-trivial irreducible representations. And we just sum over all the vertices, take their signs, and take their tangential representations. And then we define an equivalence relation on the set of all uh, generalized GKM graphs by saying that two such graphs are equivalent if their polynomials are equal. So I mean, you can get cancellations in these. Could you repeat what you said about a T3 action on S6? The, what did you claim about that? I think you can't. There wasn't one? An equivariant, almost complex structure. I think that's true. OK, so we have an equivalence relation on these, the set of generalized GKM graphs. And now we can define something called the connected sum of such graphs. And this can happen if you've got two, two graphs and uh, we take the connected sum at two vertices exactly when their labelings are equal but the signs of those vertices are opposite. So we can take the connected sum by removing the two vertices and just connecting up all the, the edges that match each other. Uh, so then we get a connected graph with two fewer vertices, and we have the following equation that the polynomial associated to the connected sum is equal to the sum of the two polynomials, which if you're familiar with cavordism is a familiar formula. Well, it looks like it's a familiar formula. Okay, so complex cavordism is a well-known subject, well-studied. Uh, we know by theorem of Milner and Novikov that non-equivariantly we can take the bordism theory of stably complex manifolds, which we all donate by omega star u, and that this is isom isomorphic to the coefficient ring of some Tom spectrum associated to complex universal bundles which is isomorphic to a polynomial algebra. Now, people have tried to do this equivalently, and Connor and Floyd in the 60s initially came up with well, the definition for uh, a geometric form of equivariant bordism, where well, I use the same definition, we use equivariant manifolds. So, we let omega, omega star u tk to know the co commutative geometric equivariant complex bordism rim of tangentially stably complex tk manifolds. Of course, you can do this for any, any compact lead group. We're only really interested in the torus today. And not very much is, is, known, is known, about, uh, known about these groups whatsoever. <laughs> it's a very uh, hard subject to try and describe this, this ring. So we're going to try and attempt to extract some information using the <laughs> combinatorial data we have. So we're going to let F star denote the bordism ring of pairs XV, where X is a stably complex manifold with trivial action. And V is a complex equivariant bundle over X without trivial factors in the, in the fibers. We use this to define uh, a map from our bordism theory into F star, where we take the connected components of the fixed point set, and they're, they're obviously stably complex manifolds with trivial action, and we consider their normal bundles into M. And 
Tom Deek, I think in the 70s, proved that for the torus, this is a monomorphism with his student Loeffler. Okay. And essentially, it's only for the torus that this is a monomorphism. Tom Deek? Okay. So in the 70s. I'm not entirely sure if he also he might have proved it with his student, Peter Loeffler. Okay. So now we're going to again restrict to our case. So we're going to let Z, the notation of Conor and Floyd, let Z denote the subgroup of omega given by elements that are represented by uh, manifolds that only have isolated fixed points and that satisfy the GKM condition. And then the mon monomorphism on the previous slide can suddenly be written, can be written like this. We're going to map from Z into polynomial, polynomial algebra generated by the non-trivial irreducible representations. And so we take a class in our borderism group and we sum over the fixed points, the tangential representations of the fixed points. Sorry, I might have missed it, but did, did you say what it means for two manifolds to be bordered? Uh, no. Two, two manifolds. Two equivariant manifolds are bordered if there's a, a manifold of one dimension higher with boundary with uh, a G action, so that when you restrict the G action onto the boundary, the two manifolds are equivalent. In, in this context, right, there's, there would be something to be proven because of all of the orientations that you're in. Well, it's certainly something to be proven, yes. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is very non trivial. Um, but it is work from Tom Deak in the 70s. So. And if it's monomorphism, no matter what the action on M is, uh, no, it's always a monomorphism. If it's a torus, yeah? yeah? For torus actions. Yes. Yes, definitely. Okay, so this, this formula looks very similar to one several slides ago. It was uh, very similar to the one that we just defined from an abstract generalized GKM graph. So you can guess what's going to happen. Okay, so, so there's also a, a multiplicative monomorphism, again first studied by Tom Deke and many people other, uh, since then, uh, including recently Bush, Dabber, Panov and Ray in their paper Toric Genera, and they call this the, the Toric genus. So this is a monomorphism from this geometric equivariant borderism ring into MU star BT, which factors through an equivariant homotopical borders and theory that you might, that you can define in, a, in, a, in an analogy to the, to the, uh, the Tom spectrum non-equivariantly. So we have a map from, a Pontragin Tom map from omega star UTK, the geometric version, into well, we would call it MU star TK, uh, which is just a Tom spectrum given by equivariant universal complex bundles. But there's no inverse to this map. There's no, there's no map backwards because we've lost transversality in the equivariant case, uh, which is essential for proving this, this inverse. But we do have that it's a monomorphism, again, for the torus. And then, well, this, this map really is just defined to be the completion of the augmentation ideal of this ring. Represent borders on the manifolds that have free TK action on them? Isn't that related to free TK? Yes, action? yes, exactly. Oh, it's cohomology. Uh, yeah, it's cohomology. So there's another way we can define this. Is it, uh, you apply the Borel construction to the unique projection, sending M, M to a point, and so we get this uh, map here. <coughs> And then you can show this is complex oriented. Uh, and so if you know the work of, of Quillen, we get a, a Giesen homomorphism, which gives us a map uh, which changes degree by 2n. Uh, and we just define and this, this map is just the image of, of 1. <coughs> but it's, 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 the, it's the same map. 
So you choose, you can choose which, whichever definition you like. So then we're going to let S be the multiplicative set in the cohomology, the cobaldism of BTK, uh, be generated by the Euler classes of non-trivial irreducible represent the bundles generated by non-trivial irreducible representations that you see there. And we get a commutative diagram where we have the universal toric genus going across the top. We have restriction to the normal data around the fixed point sets coming down on the left there. And then on the right, this is your standard localization map. And there's a map going across, across the bottom. So this is a commutative diagram, and all the maps here are monomorphisms. And Hanke showed that not only all the maps are injective, it's a, also a pullback square in about 2005. So now again, we're going to restrict back to our case, our, our manifolds. Uh, and we also get that this is a, a commutative pullback square. Uh, we're now on the left, we're mapping into polynomial algebra. And this gives us the following fixed point formula uh, proven in the Toric genera paper by Bushdaber, Panov, and Ray, um, which looks like it belongs in the localization, but actually it belongs in the image of this map here. And if you know about formal group laws, you can write this in, in terms of formal group laws in a very nice way. And so now we're going to extend that commutative square to the right using a, a Boardman homomorphism. So this is really just using the, the Tory Stong map from MU into K smash MU uh, and applying it on the uh, cobaldism uh, of BTK. And the Tory proved again that this is a commutative bullback square with all maps injective. So we've just extended this square to the right using the Torres Dung map. And the reason we do this is that now we call the coefficients of the image of that map the equivariant K theory characteristic numbers. Um, it's not a very good, good name because they're not actually numbers, they're polynomials. But <laughs> coming from the non equivariant theory, it's just initially what they were called. And so, because it's a monomorphism, these, these numbers or polynomials completely determine the equivariant bordism. And so, we have this theorem where we say, if we have a polynomial in this algebra that, is, that comes from some abstract generalized GKM graph, uh, then, its image belong, then its image across the bottom belongs in the image of, of lambda localization, which means that every equivalence class of these oriented generalized GKM graphs comes from a bordism class. So there is a manifold that comes with that fixed point data exactly. A tangentially stably complex TK manifold. Okay, so now we're going to just look at the case, the, the maximal case, where the torus is half dimensional. Um, and this is, these are now, these are called torus manifolds, and we're the subject of a paper by Maida, Masuda, and Panov. Um, and in this case, we only need to assume that the action is effective because then the GKM condition automatically follows because uh, these weight vectors must form a basis. And also the, the, the fact that all the fixed points are isolated also follows because of dimensional reasons. Okay, so we're gonna, the idea is we're now going to try and classify all these GKM graphs up to equivalence. So, we're going to consider the free exterior Z algebra on the set of non-trivial irreducible representations. And we're going to define uh, 
a faithful polynomial to be a polynomial in the nth power of this exterior algebra if the indeterminants from each monomial form a basis. So each monomial consists of elements from uh, the set of non-trivial irreducible representations which come with the weight vectors. So if those vectors from the monomial form a basis for all the monomials in the polynomial, then we call this polynomial a faithful polynomial. Now suppose we have an oriented torus graph. So this is a generalized GKM graph in the, in the case when uh, k equals n, the maximal case. And we have a vertex p, and we order the basis elements so that the, um, the determinant of those column vectors in the ordering give you this, exactly the sign of p. Then we can define a, a faithful exterior monomial associated to such uh, to these basis elements, and it's completely well defined. Um, and then we define the torus polynomial, the oriented graph, to be the faithful exterior polynomial. We just sum over all the fixed points, all, the, all these monomials. Now we're going to define J n star to be the set of non-trivial elements of the maps from S1 into Tn, which is in some sense dual to the irreducible representations. And for each exterior polynomial H, we can obtain a dual polynomial H star by taking a faithful monomial, so a monomial that forms a basis, and the duality is given by taking the transpose of the inverse of that uh, invertible matrix, and we can think of the column vectors then as elements of homomorphisms from S1 in to Tn, and we define a chain complex on such, uh, such a thing where the differential of the boundary operator is just given by summing, taking the alternating sum and forgetting elements as you go, go along. And it's quite easy to see that uh, d squared equals zero. So this is a boundary operator chain complex. And so the theorem is that if we have a faith, suppose we have a faithful polynomial in the nth power of Jn, the set of non-trivial irreducible representations, then we can completely classify those that come from the oriented torus graph. It comes from an, an oriented torus graph if and only if um, the boundary of the dual is, is zero. So. Each polynomial is a torus polynomial of a, an oriented torus graph, if and only if the boundary of the dual is zero. So we let Kn denote the group of all faithful exterior polynomials, such that this is true. So this is, so this obviously, this completely, this shows that Kn is equal to the set of equivalence classes of those torus graphs that we defined earlier. So we obtain this commutative diagram of monomorphisms where H here is uh, essentially just putting back in the, the signs of the fixed points. And so from the previous theorem and the, the theorem that says that every such, uh, <clears throat> every polynomial coming from a torus graph comes from uh, a manifold, we can show that we have an isomorphism here of abelian groups, so that in this case Z2n is uh, isomorphic to Kn, this abelian group of polynomials whose uh, boundary is zero, the boundary of the dual is zero. So now we can define these graded rings by keeping n, n is fixed here, so we, this is always half dimensional and you just increase n from zero zero upwards, uh, and these are non-commutative rings. If you take a Tn action and a Tm action, if n, are different, is n, if n is different to m, then uh, Tn cross Tm is different from Tm cross T, 
n uh, because your representations will be different if they're different sizes. So these are non-commutative rings. Uh, now as a cor uh, corollary, we say that if we take m and suppose, let's suppose it's, it doesn't bound, so associated to it is this uh, non-zero polynomial and because of the way the boundary operator was defined, we know it goes to zero, it must have at least n plus one monomials. So as a strict lower bound, we, we know that n plus one is the minimum number of fixed points of a stably complex torus manifold that doesn't bound. Some people are interested in those sorts of theorems. Okay, so finally, we're gonna look at quasi-toric manifolds. So if you, Andre's talk yesterday, defined extensively, talked about quasi-toric manifolds. So these are just even dimensional smooth closed manifolds with a locally standard smooth torus action is always space is a simple polytope. And we'd find a quasi-toric pair to consist of an or combinatorial oriented simple polytope with a map that satisfies the general davis yaniskevich condition, star condition. Um, so we, we get a bijection between the set of quasi atomic manifolds that come with a stably complex TN structure and these quasi toric pairs. And we can define a product on the quasi toric pairs. On the polytopes, you just take the Cartesian product of the two polytopes, and you can define the product of the characteristic map uh, just using the two characteristic maps and embedding lambda one in the first section and lambda two in the second section. So again, you can s we're going to define the ring of quasi toric pairs where you take free abelian group generated by all the pairs um, where plus is disjoint union. And so this, is, this again is a graded non-commutative ring because these can be different sizes. It's lambda one or lambda two. So. And we get a homomorphism of non-commutative graded rings going from the ring of quasi-toric pairs into this bordism theory we defined earlier. Uh, and you just obviously get that by constructing the omni-oriented quasi-toric manifold associated to the pair. Uh, some of these pairs obviously go to zero. Uh, the question is, when is this map surjective? This, is, this would be an equivalent version of the bush darber ray theorem that every uh, complex Kibbutzim class contains a quasi-toric manifold above dimension two. Uh, so this is still a conjecture, it's been we've done it for very small cases. Uh, and as a remark, this corresponding conjecture for small covers and unoriented real torus actions uh, was done by Zhi Lu and his student, Guang uh several years ago. So we're still working on this, this conjecture, it's significantly <laughs> more complicated. Uh, and that's where I finish.